God, I pray that you would challenge us not just to make a worship time on a Sunday morning like this when we gather together, but may our very life be worshiped to you. It's going to require a transformation in our thinking. That's what your Bible tells us, that we're not going to be conformed to the pattern of this world. But we're going to transform our minds to think your thoughts, to focus on you. And then, God, that lifestyle becomes one of perpetual worship to you. Because that posture of our hearts is one that you come to meet with. You come to reveal yourself in a greater dimension to us. So God, may we be perpetual worshipers. May we be constantly allowing you to transform our minds, to think our thoughts like your thoughts, to be in a place where you reveal yourself to us. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for making that possible. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our counselor and our helper. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Well, we are beginning our uh, series that uh, we try to do this at least once a year um, that uh, we simply call the Q series. The Q is for questions. Um, and this is a time when instead of me um, spending some time praying and saying, God, what, uh, what message would you like to share? Uh, to your people is really just kind of we're flipping the script a little bit and saying um, what's on your mind what what kind of questions do you have and and you know it, it strikes me uh, interestingly if you'll go through the gospels and just take note of the question marks um, you never see Jesus get upset um, by the questions he can't he's, he's like I can't believe you're asking me another question he said, okay, I'll answer this one. I'll address this one. Because during the time of questions is where a dialogue can really begin to take place. When you have a statement that ends with a period, that kind of is almost saying, there, I'm done. But with the question mark, it's like, this is what I think. What about you? Do you see it like this? What happens this? And there's this, this dialogue that takes place. So Jesus was always interested in answering questions. And a lot of the epistles... Um, you'll see like Paul and Peter and John saying in their letters, I got this question from you. Um, somebody was wondering about this. And, and so a lot of those official epistles are uh, addressing of questions as well. And so that's what we're going to do. So we've already had some questions turned in. And I'm going to um, start uh, this morning by answering a couple of those that have been turned in. And I've kind of grouped a few of the questions together. But there's going to be a couple other ways that you can submit questions as well, because I, I know we're not going to be able to cover them all um, this morning. And so one way that you can do it, if you want to do it like right now, like while I'm talking, if you've got a question, um, there's going to be a phone number on the screen here that you can send a text to this number, and uh, you can send in your question that way. Or um, Scott's got some good old-fashioned paper in the back. Um, <laughs> Remember that, you know, before 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 the, the tech days, um, you actually pull out you know something wrote down. So um, if if you've got a question and you'd like to, to jot it down, um, if it's better for you to think of it that way, um, you can um, you can just flag him down. And he can get you some paper and turn in your question that way. And then throughout the week, because we're going to be doing this over the next couple of weeks as well, if you think of something, um, you can if you go on to the Calvary Facebook page, there's a a link on there where you can just send your question through that way. Um, we've also given you ways to do it through email and Twitter. There's a lot of different ways that you can send your questions as you think of them. Or you can even do this. I got a phone call um, saying, not really sure how to write my question down, so let me just talk to you about here's what I'm kind of questioning, uh, what I'm wondering, and then you know we can kind of form a, a question on that. So however you want to get the questions to us. So let me start with this, and then... Um, I'm going to open it up to you to, to uh, get a little feedback from you on even this first set of questions. Got a couple of questions regarding um, the books of the Bible or the composition of the Bible itself. Um, you know, what, what went into making the Bible? So this Bible we have here, 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. How did, how did we get those books in there? 
what about the reliability of the books that are in there? How do we know that the right ones made it and, and there weren't some right ones that got cut or, or didn't? And uh, you know, were there more than 66 books? How, how did all this go in here? Um, had another question about translations. Um, is there a, a one translation that might be better than another? How do we how do we kind of measure those sorts of things? So it really just kind of the whole, if I could clump those together, there's about four questions that I just kind of um, got all re centering around that. But here's where I'd like to start. I'd like to start with the New Testament. I want, I want to start with that part first, those 27 books that make up the New Testament. And because this is the one where, although there is some question people that will raise sometimes and they'll say, I've heard that there should be more books than the 39 in the Old Testament. Um, especially lately, it seems like there's been a lot more um, where people said, oh, we've uncovered a lost gospel that should be a part of the New Testament scripture. Um, it shouldn't just be 27. Or I've even heard people say, well, really the, the 27 books, that was kind of a political move, um, the way that they put those 27 books together. And um, so the people that were had the most political clout kind of won and, um, and came. So how, how do we address this? Well, I, I like, there, there's an, uh, an author, um, J. Warner Wallace is his name. He is a cold case detective. Now, you know what a cold case detective does? They're trying to solve a case that has gone cold. And a lot of the times, they don't even have the original eyewitnesses to go back and cross-examine. Now, they might have it written down somewhere. They might be able to go in a file and pull out and say, well, at the time of the event, here's the, the statement that they made to the police, or we sat down and interviewed them, and here was a transcript of the interview. But they can't actually go back. So, you know, if I, if I was reading something and there was an interview with Carrie, I can't go back to Carrie and say, hey, Carrie, I was reading this statement. What did you mean by this? Can you clarify this? She's not around anymore, and so that's why it's a cold case. Now, J. Warner Wallace lived a, a substantial part of his life as an atheist. One of his fellow detectives challenged him on this and he said, hey, why don't you investigate the claims of the New Testament wearing your cold case detective hat? I mean, we have written records, but we don't have actual live bodies that you can go back and cross-examine. And um, J. Warner Wallace is very successful. Um, if you've ever watched uh, NBC date, uh, uh, Dateline, the, the nighttime show that they do, you'll see every once in a while one of his cases will be featured on there, a case that he solved and brought to trial after numerous years of this being cold. So he's really good at doing this. And so he said, sure, I'll take on that challenge. And in the process of doing that, not only discovered, uh, convinced himself that the, uh, the Bible was legitimate, but also realized that he needed a relationship with Jesus as well. And um, one of the things that he brought out is the different kinds of faith that people have. And I, and I like this. He said, you know, some people have an unreasonable faith. Despite the evidence that you show them to the contrary, they just stay fixated on the thing that they believed. So it's unreasonable because you're showing them all of this evidence to the contrary, but they still stick right there. There's another kind of faith that's called a blind faith. And that's like, I don't have any evidence at all, but I just believe it. I... I why? I don't know. I just do. There's no evidence there. And then he says there's a third type of faith that's called reasonable faith. And that's the one where you weigh everything. You look at it and say, does this answer 100% of my questions? Is it, you know, I'm totally without any uh, doubt whatsoever? Probably not. But it's reasonable to believe this based on all the evidence. It seems to support this conclusion. And so that's what I, I, when we look at the Bible, which we're, we're looking at just talking about the New Testament, documents that are 2,000 years old, um, can we answer every question? No. But there's enough evidence, I think, that we can present to make it a reasonable faith for us to trust this. So again, let me show you three criteria that J. Warner Wallace uses about specifically the authors of the New Testament books. And I like all three of these. They all start with, the, there are two words, they all start with A and S, okay? So you can come up with it. The first one is attributed statements. In other words, the people in the Bible, did they claim that they were the ones who wrote down what they're writing down based on what they saw with their own eyes, okay? 
So in other words, was it an eyewitness report? Well, we, we actually, we have that recorded in the scripture. We have the apostles like Peter and John saying what we've seen with our eyes, what we've touched with our hands, what we experienced, we were right there walking alongside Jesus while these events were taking place. And so when we talk about the four gospels that tell the story of Jesus' life, we've got Mark, which was written first, um, was he was a relative of Peter and was really writing down Peter's remembrances as Peter shared the story, his eyewitness account of what took place there. The Gospel of John um, was the final one written, so the Kennedy's bookends. He said, wrote, I was an eyewitness to this thing. Luke, right there in the middle of those things, Luke said, I didn't necessarily walk around with all these people, but I went and interviewed people who did. So I interviewed the first-hand witnesses. Okay? Not secondhand. I didn't go to like Harrison and say, Harrison, what did your dad tell you? You weren't there, but your dad was there. What did your dad tell you? And now you tell it to me, you know, and we're going back. It's like several times removed. Luke said, I, I went and interviewed the people and put it together in an orderly fashion. And you know what? Even today, modern historians talk about how uh, wonderful Luke's history is, how, how he was just is a historian of first rank the way that he went through that. And then Matthew, one of the 12 apostles that walked around with Jesus those three plus years and was right there and saw everything himself. So these statements were attributed to eyewitnesses, okay? Now, the second thing that we wanna look at is what J. Warner Wallace calls ancient support. At the time that these eyewitnesses were writing, other people around them, what were they saying? Were they saying things that were confirming, corroborating, to use kind of the you know, police lingo, this is corroborating evidence? Um, or were they writing something completely different? They were going, uh, no, that's not exactly the way that it happened. Well, we do have corroborating testimony. We have these, this ancient support. And here's what I love, the people that we have it from, two people that are also very noted historians. One of them, his name is Tacitus. He is a Roman historian. Now, think about this for a second. He's a Roman historian. The Romans and the Jews, they didn't get along so well. The, the Jewish people revolted a couple of times against the Romans. They despised having the Romans there in what they said, this is our holy land. And so there was constant uh, friction between them. In fact, at, in 70 AD, um, Jerusalem actually fell, that the, the final Jerusalem or, or Jewish uprising was put down by the Romans. And so if anybody had an ax to grind, if anybody wanted to say, hey, uh, you know, I want to do whatever I can to just kind of deep six this, it would have been Tacitus, the Roman historian. And yet what he writes corroborates what we see in the New Testament epistles. There's another guy, his name is Josephus. Now Josephus is a Jew, but he's also a Pharisee. If you go through the Bible, what group gave Jesus the most trouble? The Pharisees, right? Even after Jesus ascended back into heaven, and the new Christians are going around telling people about Jesus as the Messiah, who were some of their main persecutors? The Pharisees. And yet Josephus, this Pharisee, as he writes his testimony, he as well corroborates what was written in the New Testament. Then if we look at just the generation right following that, so the people who were kind of protégés, um, of the prophets, uh, or of the, the apostles, excuse me, the people that were getting mentored by them. A lot of times they get uh, grouped together in a category that people call the church fathers because they were kind of the ones that were helping as the church grew. Do you know that by the time that we get to um, where the canon of scripture, the 27 books of the New Testament are put together, looking at the writings of these church fathers, there's over 36,000 direct quotations from New Testament scripture. In fact, one person has said you could almost recreate the entire New Testament just from the quotations that were in the people that were following. So you have both those people that would be adversarial to the gospel and those people that were supporting the gospel but had time to process and think about, okay, we're living this thing out now. Is it still hold water? Is it still true? All of those support the eyewitness statements 
from the, the, the attributed statements. And then the third thing that we want to look at as well is the authoritative selection. The, the 27 books of the New Testament, there was a selection process. And what was the criteria? What did they consider? Well, the number one criteria at the top of the list was this very first one. Were they eyewitnesses? Were they actually there? Now, when you get to about 367 AD, there's a, a man named Athanasius who has compiled a list of 27 books. Okay, So we're about 250 years removed from the time of the events that took place in the New Testament. And Athanasius is saying, we've looked at all of the books that are floating around, all the manuscripts, and we can be sure that these 27 books hold up to the standard, that they were eyewitness accounts, that they fit with the overall theme of Scripture, that they're not contradicting, contradicting other things that are in Scripture. So here's one of the things that you hear sometimes. You'll hear that like um, the Council of, of Hippo that was in um, 381 um, AD, that they're like, well, that's when the list of Scripture was put together. Those guys came up with the list. No, they didn't. They, they recognized the list. They didn't create the list. They didn't authorize the list. They just recognized that this list that Athanasius had kind of compiled from all of the other scholars, they said, that's it. Those 27 books make up the, the complete list. Uh, the other ones, many of them that are that people refer to as the lost gospels, don't even claim um, to be written by eyewitnesses. They're kind of, well, somebody told me and somebody told them and I just happened to write it down. So they don't claim to be authoritative. They don't claim to be eyewitnesses. They don't claim to be inspired. So that right there is gonna remove them. And many of them are contradictory to scripture. They kind of have their own agenda. Um, and some of them, they're like, we have no idea who wrote this. There's no way for us to verify who wrote this at all. And so we can't include this in anything. Um, plus, most of these things that now some people refer, refer to as the Lost Gospels or the Gnostic Gospels were written so far after the event took place. They, they were hundreds of years. Whereas, like I said, Mark, 50 AD would have been the late, absolute latest that he would have written his letter, his gospel. That's only, we're talking about 15 to 20 years removed from the events. The last gospel to be written was John's gospel, which was written just a little bit before 70 AD. That's not too far down the road either. Some of these other gospels that people want to try to include, some of these things are written in the 200 and 300 AD range. They're 200, 300 years after it. But you know what? Even when you get to 185 AD, one of the church fathers, Irenaeus, is already writing letters to people saying, I've already found these letters that are, that people are trying to pass them off like they're scripture, but they're, they're fake. They're, they're not real. They don't, they don't hold up. Now, here's one of the reasons why. That's the New Testament. Let's look at the Old Testament. 39 books of the Old Testament. Now, when Jesus was on earth, what did he call the Old Testament? He didn't call it the Old Testament. <clears throat> what did he call it? Scripture. Yeah, he called it Scripture. All right? That was it. There was 39 books. You know, that list was settled, defined, um, authoritative by about the 4th century B.C. 400 years before Jesus is walking around on earth, before his disciples are writing what's called the New Testament, those 39 books of the, of the Old Testament were already set. The books that people wanted to try to insert, insert in there the apocryphal books, as they're, they're referred to, the, the Jews had already determined those don't fit. They, they, they don't line up with what our history is. Have you ever noticed, if you read in the Old Testament, how, um, how important it was in people's minds to keep the history? When people would, they, they was a badge of honor for them to say, you know, my name is, I'm the son of, who's the son of, who's the son of, who's the son of. They would quote their family tree back seven, eight, nine generations. That was a badge of honor to show the connection there. You look throughout all of the Old Testament scripture and you'll see how much uh, history and family lineage was important to them. And so the scribes who were writing this down, 
not only did they have to, to follow this very accurately, in fact, to the letter, literally in order for some of the, for scripture to be authorized as an authentic uh, copy of, you know, what had come before, there was letters that had to appear like right in the middle of the page. They'd count them. Nope, it's not in the middle of the page. Rip it up, start over. It's, you've missed something. You're, you're off somewhere. They were so accurate about that. But for generations, people could read this thing and go, if it wasn't true, they could look and say, this isn't true. I know what my family history is. This is not accurate. Now, when we move into the New Testament, <clears throat> listen to what Paul says. He says almost the exact same thing about the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 15, now this is written about the mid-50s A.D., Okay, so again, really close to the time the events took place. He said, now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. In other words, this is either true or it's not true. Now listen to what he says. For I received what I passed on to you as of first importance. And then he quotes this creed that people have been you know, saying. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What's he talking about? What we now refer to as the Old Testament. Okay, That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Okay, Still referring back to that. And then he appeared. Now check this out. That he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of whom are still living though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all appeared to me as one abnormally born. Now what's he saying here? He's saying there's a lot of people that saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead, and this gospel that we're preaching to you is all based on the fact that he died according to scriptures and was raised from the dead according to scriptures. And there's people that you can walk right over to them and you can ask them, what happens when you write 200 years later? Can you ask people that were alive and actually saw it? No, you can't. But, but, but Paul is laying it right on the ground, uh, on the, putting it all on the line here. He says, if you want to question this, if you doubt this, here's the people. I can give you the list. Here's my references. <laughs> Go talk to these people and see what they say. They can confirm it or they can refute it. Okay? It was a gutsy move on his part to do that. But it was all based on this scripture that had already been established. Now, here's the other thing that, that I think that we need to, to remember about this. Not only were those scribes very accurate in transmitting things, but the, the process of not only writing down a copy of the scripture, but also the preservation of that got better as time went on. I mean, that just makes sense, right? Our technology is better today. Um, I think that you'd probably say that uh, the computer that you're using today is a little bit better than the one you used 10 years ago, okay? Technology tends to improve over time. The technology of writing stuff down and being able to preserve it long-term improved, as well as their skill to make sure that what they were transmitting from copy to copy was improved as well. Now, we had a complete Bible that was dated back to about 1000 AD, that was written in Latin, and we had all of the, the, we had the complete Bible down there. And historians, professors that you would ask at that time, they would say, we think that we can be sure that this is about 95% accurate, just based on what we have. But then, some shepherd boys discovered something one day in a series of caves that now, we now refer to as the Dead Sea Scrolls. These were these documents that had been preserved for years. When they went back and looked at them, they now found copies of scripture that went back to 250 BC, over 1200 years older than what we had before. And you know what we found? They were identical to what we had at 1000 AD. And so I wanna read for you a quote. I love that Dr. Peter Flint, one of the, a well-known uh, historian who studied all this, listen to what he said. The biblical Dead Sea Scrolls are up to 1,250 years older than the traditional Hebrew Bible that we have. We've been using a 1,000-year-old manuscript to make our Bibles, but we've now got scrolls going back to 250 B.C., so our conclusion is simply this. 
The scrolls confirm the accuracy of the biblical text up to 99%. And basically, the differences, if you've ever looked at Hebrew letters, it looks a little bit like kind of our modern calligraphy. Um, you know, it's very flowy, and, and it would be like where this little f was supposed to touch the top part, and it didn't. There's a little gap, and so that technically makes it a different letter. That's what they're talking about when they're saying 99% accurate. It wasn't like, oh, um, he used it. He said that Joe was there, but it was really, you know, Bill that was there. It wasn't like a change like that. It was, oh, this, we read that as a letter E before, and now it's a letter A. Here's where else we've, we've, we've come a lot farther is in our translations of the Bible. <clears throat> now, every one of us, um, unless somebody's read, is anybody reading uh, ancient Hebrew or ancient Greek? Anybody flew into those? Well, other than Josh, because, you know. I mean, uh, so unless you're reading ancient Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic, you are reading a translation of the Bible. If, if, if you're reading it in English, you're reading a translation. Okay? Somebody had to take that. Now, um, the first English Bible is not, as some people think, it's not the King James Version, or what's called the Authorized Version. Um, John Wycliffe actually had the first complete English Bible before that. But then you'll notice that when you get into, when, when in 1611, when... King James authorizes a Bible to be uh, to print it, be printed. There's there's been a couple of changes from Wycliffe's translation. Shortly after that, a couple hundred years after that, you have a revised version, the revised authorized version that comes out, and there's a couple of changes of words in there, and people go, hey, what's what's happening here? Well, again, listen, we're we're reading the Hebrew and the Greek. In languages that aren't, there's nobody that speaks those languages anymore. The Jews in in uh, Jerusalem today that speak Hebrew, it's not exactly the same Hebrew that the Old Testament was written in. Just like, have you read Shakespeare? We don't typically talk like that anymore. What light through yon window breaks? You know, we don't we don't speak like that anymore. So our language has changed as well, just like the Hebrew has. But here's what happened when the uh, uh, Napoleon's forces were in Egypt, they uncovered a stone, a black kind of granite looking stone. On top of the stone was um, these hieroglyphics, Egyptian hieroglyphics, which scholars really hadn't been able to translate. They were like, on, uh, we think maybe that means a sun, I'm not really sure. You know, they're, they're trying to, but down below, this was also the same text that was up here in Egyptian hieroglyphics down below was written in a more modern form of Greek. And we said, oh, hey, we know Greek. It's the same words up here. And all of a sudden, we can begin to translate that one. Anybody know what that stone was called? Rosetta the stone. Rosetta Stone, right? All of a sudden, that unlocked for us languages that we hadn't been able to really fully grasp before, the nuance of some of the language. And so that's why, as time goes on, you have translations that change some words in there because we've just figured out a little bit more. We, we've understood a little bit more of this ancient language, how this works. Now, there's a difference between a translation and a paraphrase. Okay? A translation is where you are trying to do kind of a word-for-word -word translation. You're like, this is the Hebrew word, we're just going to write it down in English. Well, that even runs into some difficulty sometimes because sometimes the one Hebrew word might mean, okay, like the word Yeshua. It's one word, but it actually, in order for us to translate it into English, it means Jehovah saves. So we, even then, we can't quite do a word-for-word -word translation. So then some translations try to say, well, let's do a thought-for-thought -thought translation. The thought of that phrase was, Jesus is the one who saves us, right? So we, we kind of do this thought. Now, a paraphrase is different. A paraphrase, if you were here last week, um, I shared a verse from 
1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. And there's a word that Peter uses in there, sanctified. If you were here, you know I came up with what I told you, the way that I remember the word sanctified is saintified. And so I put it up on the screen, right? And I changed where Peter said the word sanctified. I changed it to my word of saintified. One of the things I said when I did that is I said, this is the Craig Owens paraphrase. Okay? I'm putting it in my words. Okay? So, here'd be another one. Remember my, uh, my friend Greg Garofalo, really good Italian guy. Very vivacious, full of life. And uh, I remember him telling me one day, he goes, he goes, Craig, I just read this story. He goes, this, I never saw this before. He's a new Christian at the time. He goes, this is so wild. Peter goes, hey, Jesus, we got to pay our taxes. And Jesus goes, I know, Peter. Just go fishing, and the first fish you catch, open its mouth. There'll be a coin in there. You can go pay our taxes with that. And Peter went, right, okay. That was the Greg Garofalo <laughs> paraphrase of that story, right? He was just telling it in his Italian excited style, right? Um, one of the paraphrases that, uh, that I like to read every once in a while is the message that Eugene Peterson put together. It's not a word for word or thought for thought. It's Eugene Peterson saying, hey, this is kind of street language. This is just kind of everyday conversation. This is how just, you know, when friends are together talking, this is how they talk. And so he kind of puts in the... So here's what my recommendation is. Um, it's not really, is there one translation that's better than another translation? Which one, when you're reading it, feels more natural to you as you're reading it? Now, when I grew up, I grew up with the King James Version of the Bible. A lot of the verses I memorized, I memorized in King James. And so sometimes when I want to look up the reference to a verse, I have to go onto my Bible software and I type it in in King James because that's how I remember it. Okay, But my daily Bible study, my daily devotion times, I usually use like the New International Version or sometimes the New Living Translation, something that's a little bit more modern English, a little bit more of my style. Now, where I'd be careful though, is that some paraphrases, they uh, have an agenda. They're, they're trying to make a point. Um, there was one that, that went a little, they wanted to try to use all-inclusive language. And so they wanted to say, well, anytime that it says he, let's put in there he or she. Well, their first, their first attempt at doing that, they changed every he to he or she, even when it was obviously he. Like if Peter, if Jesus said something like, Peter, I want you to do this, and then it says he went and did this, it's clearly talking about a he, but they just went through the first time and changed everything to he or she went to do this. Well, no, it's, it was just, it was just him, you know. So that's it. You gotta, you gotta just, you know, be careful on some of the paraphrases, especially you go, well, do you have an agenda here? But the other thing that we gotta remember too is this is one whole book. And sometimes you'll hear me, I, I to just kind of make the point, instead of calling it the Old Testament, which it's, in some people's minds sounds outdated, the New Testament, oh, that sounds modern. We should just, you know, pay attention to the New Testament. Sometimes I like to refer to it as the First Testament and the Second Testament. Okay? The, the, the second one didn't negate the first one. It shined a better light on the first one. When you start going through and reading in the New Testament, you'll see all of these people saying, none of this stuff that Jesus was doing made any sense until we looked at what he was doing, and then we look back into Scripture and said, oh, it said it right there that he was going to do that. That's why he said this. That's why he went there. That's why he did this. Okay? So the New Testament, and I love this picture. You've heard, if you've been around, you've heard me say this one before. Think of the First Testament as a beautiful house, but all the lights are off. The Second Testament turns the lights on. You can appreciate. It didn't create the beauty. It just reveals the beauty that's already there. And so you're able to you're able to appreciate it now. So don't separate those two. Um, but how how do those two connect together? How how does the second testament shine light to bring out the beauty of the first testament? How does that connect together? So um, I think 
but that probably covers a lot of those questions that I got about the Bible. So let me any any questions that you have about that part, what we what we cover. Anything that you don't understand or something that maybe kind of related to that that stumped you before. Oh, I remember one thing too, another question came What about pictures in the Bible? Um, though people were really uh, touchy for a long time about pictures because they said, well, God said, you know, it's one of the commandments not to make any images, any graven images that you're going to worship. I think that um, if, you, if you look, okay, this is where people kind of inserted themselves. If you look at like Rembrandt, Rembrandt painted some scenes from the Bible. Um, Rembrandt is painting them a long time after those events are over. And if you look at the characters in the Bible, they are wearing very European clothes. Um, they are sitting in a European style house. It, it, so he's, again, that's almost like our paraphrase. He's saying, this is what it would look like in my mind, what if it was taking place right now, this is how I would see it. There's nothing wrong with pictures. I, I think that our, our minds think in pictures. If I say, think of an elephant, in your mind, you don't think E-L-E-P-H-A-N-T. You don't just think about the letters. You think about a big gray animal with the ears and the tusks and the trunk, okay? Our minds naturally think in pictures. And so I don't, I don't think that there's anything wrong with when you're paging through a Bible and you know there's a picture of Goliath and, and David is just like, just letting swing with his stone that, that brings the story alive. It, 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 as, as the cliche goes, a picture's worth a thousand words. Now, for us then to look at it and go, oh, well look at that, uh, Jesus was white. No, he wasn't. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't a white European. He, he was a Hebrew, um, a Jew. He was dark skin, dark hair, dark eye. Um, you know, so sometimes there's pictures drawn of him that make him look like he's very Anglo-Saxon. You know, that, that's not what he looked like. So we, we don't want to like, we're not going to make the picture a part of scripture and say, well, this is what it, the way it has to be. But if a picture in a Bible or a picture about a Bible story helps you visualize it, great. There's nothing wrong with pictures. They're, they're just, they'll help you see it a little bit better. Maybe remember it a little bit better. Yes? Okay. Um, I have one, um, just because my background is a little different with religion-wise, but um, the cross was always like looked upon as a sad thing for my family. Mm -hmm. So I wondered, like, what are the thoughts of like Jesus being on the cross? Like, you want people to wear those? Yep. What are your thoughts? Like, what are the thoughts on that as far as, far as like, is it something that you should, or may not should, or is it something that's recommended to wear or not wear? Right. Okay, so for those of you who may didn't hear, uh, what about the cross as far as like jewelry or decoration or something yeah. like this? Um, right. So this is this is what I uh, this is what I'd say about this. Um, so here here's here's the reason why I, I like to have a cross in here is that when Paul was preaching, he said, here, "If I if you could boil all of my sermons down to one thing, it would be this." that I want to have lifted up Jesus who was crucified on the cross and who was raised back to life again. That, that sums up my whole message, okay? okay. Um, I like an empty cross. Right. He's not there anymore. Yeah. Now what I would love to see, I don't know if anybody's ever designed some jewelry like this, I'd love to see an empty cross and an empty grave, you know, hanging right next to each other. That would really tell the full story. But I don't think that there's anything wrong, but again, Anything, if we're not careful, if we're, we're, it could become an idol of worship. Okay. Now, let, let me give you one example from the Bible. There was a time when uh, the Israelites were walking through the wilderness, and because of their disobedience, some of them had gotten bit by snakes. And so God told Moses, I want you to make this gold snake, put it on a stick, hold it up in the air, and anybody who turns and looks at the snake, if they've been bit, they're going to be healed. Okay? Now, what is that foreshadowing? Jesus being lifted up as the, you know, what's going to be our healing. Okay? But 
as time went on, this gold statue became a point of worship. And so I can't remember, I think that it was King Hezekiah. I can't remember which king it was in the Old Testament. I, I think it was Hezekiah. Actually had that destroyed. It was still around. And he said, people are worshiping this idol instead of worshiping God. And so we're going to get rid of it. And that's what we got to be careful of. This, a symbol could become the point of worship. Instead of it being a point of remembrance, there was somebody who hung on that cross that paid our penalty, but he's not there anymore. And in fact, here's a grave, but he's not there anymore either. And that's what the focus is, is the empty cross, the empty grave. It's a reminder for us, not, not a focal point of, you know, this is what happens. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. Any other questions about, about that? Do you have any that? No. No. Okay. He's been monitoring all the sources. All right. So um, I, already, I have a couple of questions, I think three or four more um, already in the queue for, for next week. Um, but uh, I, again, I want you to just, you keep turning your questions in. You can either write them down, give them to me, call me. Um, if you go onto our Facebook page or on our website, there's multiple places there where you can uh, submit your questions. Because like I said, today what I covered about the Bible, that was probably, I think, at least four different questions that I got from people that were all about that. We just compiled them together. So um, if you, you know, you're, it's very possible the questions you turn in this week might uh, coordinate with ones that we already have. I did actually just get one. Okay. So is there a way to better understand the paraphrases in the Bible? A way to better understand the paraphrases. Here's, here's a, a way to better understand scripture in general. Right? Um, somebody asked me once, they said, uh, it, was a, it was a young pastor, and he said, um, you know, I'm, I'm just starting to get into the spot where I'm going to be preparing sermons. Can I come and hang out with you um, when you're preparing a sermon? I, I don't, you don't even have to talk necessarily. I, I'll just be a you know a fly on the wall. I'll just sit over here in the corner. I just want to watch how you prepare a sermon and uh, see the resources that you use. So I you know I know how to do this. And I said you know it's probably going to be pretty boring for you um, because I don't. It's not really that glamorous. And and so he says, well, can you at least tell me what uh, commentaries you use? And I said you know I really don't. Uh, commentaries are. Um, sort of, not sort of, they're, they're man's interpretation, you know, saying this is what I think that this says, and look at this and notice this. Um, sometimes I think of commentaries almost a little bit like, remember when you would do uh, math homework, you do your assignments, and then you could turn to the back of the book, and the answers were there, and then you could check your work, okay? That's kind of how I think of commentaries sometimes. You gotta work out the problem your, yourself, and then go and read, like look at a commentary and say, oh, they got the same answer I did, or I wonder why their answer is different than my answer. The best interpreter of scripture is scripture. That, that, that's the best place to, and so when I'm preparing a sermon, I just soak in the scripture. Um, I will take a passage of scripture and I will read it uh, quietly, I'll read it out loud. I'll read it in another translation. I'll read it in a paraphrase. I will look up as many Old Testament uh, scriptures as I can that may be referenced or alluded to in that passage. Um, I, I just, or maybe there's a, a word that's been repeated several times. I will look in my concordance and say, where else does this word show up? And, and, and I'll just read those verses. It's the same thing. If you're trying to pick a translation, pick a paraphrase, or try to rank that, which one's best? Um, you want to find the one that is most consistent with the whole counsel of God's word. That's why those, those books that we talked about that got rejected, that's why one of the reasons why they were reject, rejected. Not only could they not identify who wrote it, but then they were saying, you're going a totally different direction. See, here's what I love about God's word. This was written, this book, one story, it was written over a span of 1,500 years by... 40 different authors in three different languages living on three different continents. 
And not only is there, are there no contradictions in here, this whole thing tells one unified story. It's amazing to me. So with that in mind, if I'm looking at something and I go, you just came up with an idea that is not supported anywhere else in the Bible, I'm going to hold that as really suspect until I can go back and confirm it someplace and look at it. In Acts chapter 17, let me read for you two verses <coughs> that I go to a lot. Acts chapter 17, uh, verse number two, as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, listen to this phrase, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now at that time, what's he talking about? Just what we now refer to as the Old Testament, okay? Reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. Get down to verse number 11. The Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Scripture is the best commentary on scripture. If you don't understand a passage of scripture, read more scripture. It all fits into the same pattern. If, you, if you're questioning whether a translation or a paraphrase is right or not, read, read more and see, does this fit or is this going off somewhere else? Those Bereans said, hey, Paul, we're not just going to let you say this. We're, we're looking. What did you just say? Where does that show up? How does that fit? And they, they made it fit. You're, you're, listen, you are, uh, you're doing it wrong. If you come to a sermon and whatever the person up front says that you just go, okay, he said it, she said it, sounds good, must be right. The, listen to what historian Luke said, the Bereans were noble people because they questioned. They go, okay, I heard what you said, but I want to see if it says it here too. Okay? So listen, I... I I don't get upset with people often, but I did not too long ago get upset with somebody when he told me, I read this scripture and I always took it to be this, but I heard you say this in a Sunday message, so I just went with you. I said, you can't do that. I'm a, I'm a human, I get things wrong. This is never gonna be wrong. So let's go look at it together and see if we can, if we can find some kind of conclusion here, okay? So that's how we gauge, paraphrase, translation, uh, the accuracy of somebody who's speaking. It might be their paraphrase of what they're saying. Okay, let's, let's go back, use the scripture to confirm the scripture. Use the scripture as a commentary on scripture. Okay, that makes sense? Okay. All right. Um, no, I think you know we're kind of out of time, so we won't do any new questions. But any questions that are like a follow-up to what we just talked about about the Bible and right? Um, you know, another reason why I like to ask these questions um, is, or answer these questions, is because what I want you to give me is. Um, Questions that maybe people have stumped you on before, um, because Peter writes to us. You know, our first priority as Christians is to set apart Christ as Lord. We make sure that we just want Him to be glorified. But then, secondly, he says, "Always be prepared to give an answer for the reason for the hope that you have." And then I love this third phrase that he adds: "But do that with gentleness and respect." Now, if you're not prepared to give an answer, um, a lot of times the first thing that's going to pop up in your heart is you're gonna be defensive. I don't know the answer to that one. So you're gonna to try to be defensive. Listen, here's a good answer to give to somebody. I don't know. That's, that's, that's a perfectly acceptable answer. Somebody says, well, why is it that you Christians believe this? Or how come the Bible, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that one. Um, you wanna to get together? Let's look up the answer together. 
or can I check out some things and get back with you later on that? That's perfectly fine to say that. I, I don't know the answer to that right now, but let me, let me check that one. But don't get defensive. Okay? What we believe is so good, um, you can just talk about what's good about it. I, I'd, always, I'd always get in a little leery when somebody um, has to trash the other guy in order to make themselves look good. You know what I'm saying? Like I remember um, there was a radio station several years ago when they first came on the air, their commercials to promote their own radio station was trash talking the other radio stations that were competitors to them. And I just went, I don't need to hear what, how you think that they're bad, you tell me how you're good. Mm -hmm. okay? Same thing as Christians, somebody says, defend this, prove this. You don't have to say, well it's better than well, at least we're not. You don't have to trash anybody else. We've, we've got something that is so good that we can, but you don't necessarily have to have all the answers right there. So say, I don't know. I'll go back to you. And that's, that's what we want to try to cover here. All right? So if you got questions, you can write them down, leave them here, talk to me, send them to us the electronic ways, and, and we'll get to them. So why don't you stand with me this morning? I just want to wrap up and send you out with a word of prayer, a blessing on you. Lord, I thank you for my friends. I pray that you would bless them and keep them. I pray that you'd cause your face to shine upon them this week. I pray that uh, just as we read that verse, uh, referred to that verse from 1 Peter, that there'd be something so different about their lives that people around them would say, tell me the reason for the hope that you have. Let it just be evident in their life because your blessing is so rich on their lives that the words that they speak, the actions that they do, the love that just radiates out from them sets them apart. It makes them countercultural to everybody who's around them. And they say, there's something different about you. Why do you live this way? And then God give them the ability to be able to answer that question in a way that would bring you glory. Let them do it with gentleness and with respect so that your name is exalted. So be with my friends this week, I pray. In your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you, friends. I love you. Have a wonderful week.